Welcome back, everybody. Moving right along, as they say. Get your seats, get your seats. This is going to be a killer panel. I'm so excited to listen to this. Uh, coming up now, we got magicians versus psychics. Oh, I want to see that video game. Oh, that would be so awesome. Okay, it's funny. I have uh, DJ Grothy's The Moo. But I think it's supposed to be mod, which is like moderator. So yeah, I think it's the moo. Anyway, uh, um, it, the people that are coming out on stage now, the, the oh boy, you're going to love it. It's going to be like a thing. It's going to be fantastic. Okay, here is the haiku for magicians versus psychics. Both groups flat out lie. You know, magicians, psychics. Only one's honest. Here's your moderator, DJ Grothy. From lunch. Uh, one quick thing, Randy will be joining us, and we just got a text that he is on his way. So at Skeptics events, we're always lucky to have a few magicians for color, I guess is Jamie's line. You know, magicians are around to inform the discussion. In the history of, or of the organized Skeptics movement, you'll find a number of the leading skeptics are also magicians or at least folks with backgrounds in magic. I'm thinking of people like Martin Gardner, <coughs> Penn and Teller, of course, Massimo Polidoro, uh, out there, Joe Nickel, uh, leading figure in skepticism, also a background in magic, Jerry Andrus, Bob Steiner, so many. So why are these magicians important to have around? Uh, magicians, maybe more, then scientists or philosophers actually can inform this inquiry into uh, claims, especially paranormal claimants who might be beguiling their audiences. We're very lucky to have joining us for this discussion today some of the leading magicians slash skeptics, and he saunters in, including James Randi. Yeah. Always knows how to time the entrance. And so I'll, uh, quick introductions. Max Maven is one of the world's leading mentalists. He's one of the most prolific creators in magic. He's appeared on hundreds of TV and radio programs. And the things we'll be talking about uh, on the panel today are things he and I have yammered about uh, quite a bit because it's my pleasure to have lunch with him almost every week in LA and we uh, have good back and forth. Jamie Ian Swiss is senior fellow for the James Randi Educational Foundation, a longtime advisor to the organization. He's performed magic and lectures around the world uh, uh, for uh, companies, outfits as diverse as Fortune 500 companies or uh, the Smithsonian in Institution. He's the author of The Art of Magic and two collections of essays, the most recent of which is Devious Standards. He's, a, he's appeared widely in the media. Uh, including the recent uh, uh, appearances on the Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, multiple appearances there, 48 Hours, PBS, Nova, The Today Show, uh, really advancing uh, uh, both uh, appreciation of the art of magic, but also uh, leading the charge uh, of skepticism and the application of magic to this dialogue. Banachek right here is also one of the world's leading mentalists. Now, how lucky are we that on this panel we have such talent? In addition to performing hundreds of shows each year, he's also a producer and, and an on-camera personality uh, with Chris Angel's Mind Freak and now a new show in production. He's been incredibly uh, uh, busy with that, but he's still able to advise and support the James Randi Educational Foundation through his uh, administration and leadership regarding the Million Dollar Paranormal Challenge. You'll uh, learn more about that tonight. Uh, he, what's exciting about uh, Banachek to me is that he's played an integral role in some of the, call them greatest hits of contemporary skepticism. He was involved in the uh, expose of Peter Popoff, the faith healer. He was involved in Project Alpha, the hoax of re parapsychology researchers at Washington University, uh, and in coordination with Randy and Mike Edwards, uh, really emphasized the point that you need a magician in the laboratory if you're going to be looking at these sorts of claims. Randy is the icon of the magician skeptic. 
Uh, everyone here knows Randy, but what is relevant, uh, perhaps, to, th to this discussion later on is that in addition to being awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award last year from the Australian Skeptics and also the American Humanist Association, he was also given the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy of Magical Arts. And he had some fiery things to say in his acceptance speech. Maybe we'll get into that. <laughs> Ray Hyman is Professor Emeritus of, of Psychology at the University of Oregon and a founding member of PSYCOP, serving on its executive council. His research focuses on pattern recognition, perception, problem solving, and other areas of cognition. He's written extensively on deception, the psychology of deception, parapsychology, the paranormal, pseudoscience, and skepticism. He also has a long background in magic and mentalism and teaches about psychics and cold reading. Some of you may remember his really popular workshop last year on cold reading, which is now available online for free on JREF's video channel. I'm really excited that he just completed a 10 lecture video series for the James Randi Foundation uh, entitled um, how to think about uh, not weird things, but there was a lot of weird, there dubious, were a lot of dubious claims. How to think about dubious claims, and all of that will also be available online. Last on the panel is Mark Edward, a professional mentalist. He spent over 25 years in some of the best venues around the world. He's also an active skeptic. Uh, with the Independent Investigations Group at the Center for Inquiry in Los Angeles and very involved in the local skeptics organizations in LA. He's the author of Psychic Blues, where he recounts his experiences as, uh, his experiences as a psychic, and it, its uh, introduction uh, was written by James Randi. So to begin the discussion after those introductions, do we buy this notion that magicians have a unique expertise that, uh, that really magic and magicians need to inform the project of skepticism? Uh, Ray, let's start with you on that. No. <laughs> <laughs> now Thank you, you know why I started with Ray on that, the contrary, and we've had this discussion. Why not, Ray? Uh, well, Randy, I was on a, a, a podcast this morning with Randy, took the opposite position, but I didn't have a chance to rebut it. Uh, I think that Randy's been a very good, excellent uh, debunker and the best man to have around, not because he's a magician. He's a poly man. He's a renaissance man. He knows a lot of different stuff. Many magicians were taken in by Uri Gell. We have a history of magicians, uh, uh, Robert Houdin, uh, several great magicians who tested psychics and, and endorsed them. Right. Harry Keller, uh, on and on it goes. Now, these are anecdotes, and that's all we have here, by the way. Remember, we're talking about anecdotes. There is no scientific evidence one way or the other, and we're supposed to be people who like scientific evidence. At the you, moment, I know no scientific no evidence that is gonna enable us to settle this question. You mean there's no scientific evidence that magicians help the project of that's skepticism, right. but exactly. we have our experience. Randy, what's your- We have point? anecdotes. Yeah. Right. Well, first of all, pardon me. First of all, I have to uh, correct Ray. Pardon me, Ray. Very politely, of course. You know that I respect you highly, but <clears throat> I don't accept the term of debunker. I think you, we've been through this once many years ago, perhaps. No, I uh, I believe that the JRAF and I personally, we are not debunkers. We are investigators because if you go into uh, and if you go into an investigation, frankly, with the idea, this is not so, and I'm going to show that it's not so, you've already made up your mind. Now, I, I don't investigate something that Sylvia Brown has done, for example, and say, I wonder if it's true. No, I, I really, I have enough experience not to, to have to do that. But I want to say always, I don't know. Let's find out. That's an investigator. If it turns into debunking, which it usually does, that's a different matter. But I don't want to be known, or I don't want the JREF to be known as an organization 
that debunks, we so, investigate. So Randy, on that point of magicians informing skepticism, the unique expertise, Ray said he disagrees with you on that mm -hmm. point. Uh, so does that mean you also disagree with Ray? Yes, I, I do, <laughs> with, with great respect, Ray, as you know. But uh, I think we are uniquely suited because of our experience of how deception is carried out uh, and, and in many cases technical deception as well rather than just psychological deception. I think that we are experts in that field and that consulting with us can help scientists and people like parapsychologists who are almost scientists. Uh, I think it could help them if they would listen and if they would come to us. I, I found in my experience they make great noises about doing that and then they fail at the last minute to come to us, although I've had exceptions to that as well. Mm -hmm. Jamie? So, well, I would say I actually agree with both of them, although I'd really like to see the steel cage match. Maybe we'll, <laughs> maybe we'll substitute that for the Animation. NBC tonight. Yeah. But um, I, I would say, I, 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 in a way, I agree with both, because even Randy, you, you would agree with Ray's point that certainly just the simple fact you are a magician does, does not qualify you as a psychic investigator. Oh. And, again, and the proof of that being, I mean, even Milburn Christopher was fooled by yes. Keller. Yes. So, and, and, and it's dangerous. We know that <clears throat> it's really hazardous when a magician who doesn't have the particular expertise mm -hmm. walks in and, and can actually make matters worse. Yes, oh, no, I, I agree with that point. I say an experienced right. uh, magician, of course, and not some amateur who, who does children's parties or something like that. Now, I, I, I'm not decrying the... Uh, the Some of my best friends make balloon animals. <laughs> <laughs> no, a lot of folks make a very good living doing exactly like being a children's entertainer. But that doesn't necessarily give that magician the expertise uh, and, and the strength to be able to know what's going on in the psychic, so-called psychic. I think it really depends on what, you, what you're investigating. I mean, it, oh, yes. you know, there's certain areas well, where we are experts, and there's areas where it's totally out of our area of expertise. Well, we're, we're particularly talking about psychics and psychic well, claims. Well, we, we are, and, but there's many different psychic type right, claims, right, right. and it depends what claim they're making as right. to whether we're, we're uniquely qualified or not. Well, we are uniquely qualified at detecting if somebody's using a, a, a major deception, you know, regular trickery or something that looks like it, not always necessarily able to detect that trickery, but we do have this sort of radar where we can look at things like a Sylvia Brown and immediately say, you know, it kind of looks fishy. You right. know, let's get the right experts, let's get the people. What we are qualified as well to do is to bring attention to when there is deception, much more so than, say, a scientist who's investigating it, so we can truly get the word out there being showmen as well. So before we further this, the, the, the discussion and zero in on, on psychics, and maybe magicians versus psychics. Max, you have a thought? Well, I think it's a two-sided coin. Uh, totally aside from very specific uh, cases where a magician is brought in and is or isn't able to help, the general concept of including magicians in the exploration of these things has value in and of itself because it serves to remind the non-magicians that things are not always as simple as they appear to be, that there are different ways of thinking about things than normal people do. Magicians think in different, in different ways in terms of how they approach this type of problem solving. Uh, so that has great value, I think, just as the, the fact of remembering to include magicians in the discussion. The opposite side of that coin, the bad side, is that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And just because a magician sees something, analyzes it to the best of his or her abilities, and then says, I don't find any deception here, that's not the final word. And so assuming that just because you've brought a magician into the investigation that you've then done due diligence is not enough. Mm -hmm. So I think it has to be kind of taken in context. The, the addition of magicians in these types of investigations is often extremely valuable and very often provides the breakthrough moment when it comes to discovering deception. But so, assuming that that's the, the cure-all is, I can, is I, foolish. I can say too, I must say, that we magicians, we know very well of other magicians who have the expertise, if they just want to sum it up, or they want to be honest with themselves, who fail. Mm -hmm. they, they, they absolutely, oh, I, oh, they're all fakes, except <coughs> this fella in Peoria or whatever. And there's always, not always, but there is so frequently is some place that they have a very big blind spot mm -hmm. in their heads and they don't see through it at all. So, uh, 
to drill down on this a bit, if we're talking magicians versus psychics, it seems to me the skeptical magicians who have a beef with psychics who may be using tricks, the beef isn't that they're using tricks, it's the nature of the claim surrounding the tricks or the deceptions. Of course. Uh, so uh, if you look at the history of magicians versus psychics, even your history, Randy, we've talked about this at length, there are Psych, let's use the category psychic entertainers, people who seem to do magic tricks with information, seem to read minds. There are people in the history of magic who did that every bit as strongly, say, as Uri Geller uh, in their claims that at the time you didn't seem to have a beef with. I'm thinking right now of Dunninger, mm -hmm. who uh, for the general public would make strong claims about uh, powers. Although there were some uh, differences because he would perform sort of as an entertainer and be a guest on talk shows doing things that look like tricks. So I'd, I'd ask the panel and let's start with um, Mark. Is the issue that the psychics are not disclaiming that what they're doing is fake when they're doing it? I don't even think that enters into their mind to do a display. That's no, I mean, is the issue for the magicians that the psychics that they're versus not disclaiming that what they're doing is fake? Yeah, that, that's pretty much the bottom line. That, that's, what, that's what we would like to see. But I think it's, uh, like you said, Dunninger, you know, he started a lot of his mental acts by doing the Chinese linking rings. So he would that was sort say, of a disclaimer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even even if not verbally. Yeah. Uh, so so it, some sometimes they uh, some of the, the people who I'm aware of in the past in psych, psych, folk, psychic entertainment had ways to uh, suggest that they were just like every other conjurer. Yeah. Uh, can I jump please, in at this please. point? I always thought that Dunninger and uh, Kreskin were very clever at opening with magic tricks. Uh, but both of them also would use the uh, himba rings, linking rings, not the yeah, Chinese the rings, rings. Yeah. the himba yeah. rings. The finger rings, yeah. Uh, and they would, uh, the, uh, um, they would begin by saying, look, this is not a, uh, this is a trick I'm showing you now. This is a trick. What they're doing is saying, by, by uh, inference, they're uh, using what we call the invited inference. They're, subtly claiming that everything else they're doing is a trick. And it's an, isn't a trick, Brad, I'm sorry. So, 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 so psychologically, even they're using tricks, by calling them tricks, in the con they use it in some context in such a way as to get, the rest of, uh, to get the audience to believe that the rest of what they're doing must be the real thing. And Gell Geller so, does so the if same Geller, thing. So if Geller, back in the day, started with a magic trick and then did his uh, quasi-spiritual uh, demonstrations, uh, would magicians have had less of a beef with them? Randy? Uh, oh, yes. I, I, I made an offer to uh, Geller, as you well know, DJ, and we, all of us know, I think. I made him a very generous offer when he first came upon the scene in America. I wrote him a lengthy letter. It was quite sincere. I uh, made sure that he got it by certified mail and he signed for it, so I know that he read it. And I made him an offer. I said, I can put you in touch with my agency in New York City, a very powerful agency. They can put you on the road as a magician, but not if you're claiming to have these genuine psychic powers. So I'll offer you this service for free, and I'll even, if, if you want, I will take you to New York and I'll introduce you personally. I made him a very generous offer. He never responded to that because he knew very well or he suspected strongly, and he was right, that people would accept this kind of thing, especially city, since he had the name of Stanford Research Institute behind him. So speaking of Geller, he's, uh, in a sense, what maybe the Madonna of psychics or something, <laughs> in that he's reinvented himself uh, in, in his career, and as uh, many of the panelists know, he, he's now appearing at magic conventions. And uh, we saw him, I don't want to say perform at a magic convention uh, last year, but present, you know, he sort of presented and uh, got standing ovations and it was very moving for folks. Uh, in many ways, some people 
got up and walked out, some people were very upset, and some people were very inspired, uh, is the fact that a standing ovation yeah, I said from that those it, left it, in the room. Yeah, it's, it's jaw-dropping from my vantage. So, Jamie. Jamie, uh, you, have to, you have to report this fairly. Because by saying those left on the room, it makes it sound like a large percentage left. Very few. DJ mentioned that a few people left. Very few people left. Right. Very few people left. I know of two. No, I was trying to make a point. He made a standing ovation from a very large audience. So, Jamie. I remained in my seat. That Geller, that Geller is now at Magic Conventions. Is that sort of disclaimer enough? And now he's one of you. Oh no 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 no. This is a. This was a very artful performance. Uh, afterwards, uh, after he did his show, he came up to me and said, Ray, what did you think? <laughs> but anyway. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and you said, Ray. <laughs> I said, well, you did what you were, wanted to accomplish, uh, you know, it, but uh, the, the, you achieved your goals, but those goals are not the ones of civilized society. Oh. <laughs> Ray Hyman, ladies and gentlemen. I, I, must, I must tell this giddy audience here, uh, an episode that happened to me not too long ago. <clears throat> DJ, you mentioned that I received this Lifetime Achievement Award from the Academy of Magical Arts at the Magic Castle and such. Uh, and I had the, the chance to address them briefly. I addressed them more than briefly. I took advantage of the fact that I was on the stage and I had the microphone, so there. Right, right, right. And uh, I appealed to that audience. Now this was magicians and families of magicians. It was a huge audience. This is like Oscars for magicians. Every exactly, year. Yeah. yes. So I had their attention and I said, I'm very honored to receive this, etc., cetera, et cetera, the usual thing. And then I said, <clears throat> I must ask this audience in which I see a great number of very influential and skilled magicians, why they are not of the opinion that people like Uri Geller should be put out of business because they bring disgrace to this honorable profession. And I, and I said more than that, I developed it quite fiercely. I almost had a soapbox there brought on just so I could yeah, deliver it. So, so they could see you over the podium. Neil Patrick Harris, who Neil Patrick Harris, who introduced Randy uh, and conferred the award on him, uh, as Randy was getting ever more fiery in his acceptance, Neil, continuing to smile, was ever so slightly hedging back and uh, wondering if, uh, uh, you know, someone would lob something. Because in the audience, Randy, you'll remember that half of the audience, I'm, you know, roughly half the audience, were uh, over the top enthusiastic that you spoke that at that venue. And exactly. the other half of the audience... The other half of the audience in. sat like there, yeah. looking at me like this. Yeah. And I knew that they were not on my side. They, <clears throat> why they don't have some sort of sense of honor, defend the profession, the, the honest profession of the prestidigitator. Mm. Uh, and they don't, they don't want to do it. They seem to think, oh, you, Geller is one of us. I don't want to belong to an organization which Geller is considered to be one of us, frankly. So, uh, Max, Max Maven, you're having a, a panel discussion of two. Uh, uh, please, <laughs> please share uh, your thoughts. You were at the self-same event. Yeah. I produced that event. Exactly. Now, I'm the one who arranged for Neil Patrick Harris right. to give the award to Randy, so I think I know a little about, about what was going right. on. I don't think it's fair to represent that half the audience there was, was opposed to the message Randy was giving, because I don't think that was the case. I do think that there were some people who felt that he was going long, because this, as one of the most important awards of the evening, he was on late in the show. And it was two hours into the night, and so I think the, the negatives were simply some people going, okay, well, I can hold we'll do the rest of this later. <laughs> uh, right, but I, don't, I really that. don't we think half the audience either. there but I really don't think half the audience there was opposed to your message. I think the yeah. majority of the audience there was absolutely with you in terms of, of, of the message. Well, I got a lot of silent stares from people uh, mixing with the crowd afterwards. Some people just literally turned away from me as soon as I approached. Oh, that has happened. In the past. Well, it's been documented on the guys who are doing the, the, the uh, uh, documentary about you, who were interviewed with you by Jamie the other day. Oh, yes. They recorded the whole thing. So we actually have tapes we can check. Yeah. So, so leave it to Max Maven to tell us skeptics look at the evidence. Okay. So uh, 
Let's switch gears uh, just a tad, and, and uh, we talked about disclaimers, but it seems to me when we really get riled up, it's not just about magicians pretending to be supernatural and not disclaiming that their abilities are fake. That's not the only thing that upsets us. It's people who aren't doing magic tricks, but are a different kind of fake, and I mean like fake therapist or fake counselor. The real problem is feigned expertise expertise in a sense. So you go to a, a psychic, a storefront psychic, or a, a woman at a, a new age fair or something, she's not going to do magic tricks, but she will maybe give you advice on whether or not to sell your house, yet she's not a financial planner. She may talk to you about uh, problems with your family, but she's not a family therapist. She may guide you in your career, but she's not a vocational uh, counselor. Um, so. Uh, is, is the push for magicians when engaging them just about the truth? Hey, you guys aren't actually talking to dead people, tarot cards don't actually work. Or is it about you're not in fact helping people because uh, there's no such thing as the poor man's psychiatrist? I think the truth is a good motive. Mm. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, really, I really think that being honest with your audience is, is very important for all performers. We are actors. We magicians are, are not some special category of performer. No, we're actors. We play the part of people who can actually do magic. And we do it, I hope, with a wink and a, and a shoulder, whatever, to make sure that that audience isn't going to take us seriously. I have had people when I've done some of my, my regular tricks traveling around the world, I've actually had some people approach me and say, oh, that was, that was wonderful, what you did there. I, I enjoyed the show, but when, when you told the lady her phone number, that wasn't a trick, right? And I say, oh, yes, and oh, I, I know the difference between a trick and, and a miracle, Mr. Randy, and that was not a trick, duh. <laughs> So I, I, rather than talking about the, the performer, I was just, I was talking about the sort of faux counselor. You know, when you, a oh, lot yes. of people go to psychics to get help. Uh, Mark, you were formerly uh, a psychic. Well, uh, I, I would like to clear that up yeah, just please. a little bit. Finally, but it, okay, but, since but, I have but, a group of assembled people here. Exactly, but the point is you did offer advice and helped people uh, or I, I don't know. I, I don't know, I won't say that either. Uh, again, I, it wasn't my intention to try and help them. My intention was to try and find out how this billion dollar industry works from the inside out. So, I, you know, uh, Randy, everybody who here know, who knows me from my past in skepticism. I started in skepticism in the 70s. I was a skeptic the whole time. So my plan was to get in there. You can't go to a psychic fair and say, hey, show me how you did that chakra reading. They'll just go, what are you talking about? But if you get on their good side, the wink, wink, nod, like, you know, oh, here's the young guy coming along, wants to learn the roots of what we're doing. Right. That's what I did. So, so in a sense, it's like investigative journalism or getting the inside scoop because you're accepted as one of them. That's yeah, and I wanted to be accepted as one of them. That was the, that was the plan, okay? So it became extremely unpopular with magicians for me to do that. I, I walked the tightrope. The magicians hated me because I was doing psychic work. The psychics hated me because I was a, a, seen as a magician. But fortunately, most, most psychics, they don't read Skeptic Magazine. So they didn't see that I was on the editorial board of Skeptic Magazine the whole time. So uh, it, it, I, that's, that's what it was about. So to go back to your original question, I think, uh, what was the original question? <laughs> the, now the that I've got that out of the way. Yeah, the original question is about you know, the justificatory scheme we hear some psychics give, even knowing uh, fakes. Yeah that they're a, sort of a poor man psychiatrist. They're helping people even if they're not really Well, so it's a very crude rationalization is all it is. You know, that's a rationalization for somebody who deals with people who can afford a, you know, a $2 reading. You know, yeah, poor man's therapy, but they don't have any degrees. They don't have any background most of the time. Some of them might in this economy. 
but uh, mo most of the time there are people who have just learned uh, the gift of gab. And, Max, uh, that's you, about it. Uh, I know that uh, you know there are some characters in mentalism as a subfield of magic who've used that same justification. They might do a magic show, but then also teach or conduct cold readings or psychic advising after a show to make an extra buck. Uh, there is a, there's been a swing of interest in mentalism in the past decade particularly. It, it suddenly has become much more popular uh, among dabblers, if you will, than, than it had been. And one of the things that's come along with this is a very uh, uh, shallow grasp of the term cold reading. Now the guy who understands a very deep grasp of that is Ray Hyman, who is one of the first to write serious, Non, uh, non magic books uh, and, and essays regarding cold reading. And I think Ray will agree, at least with my general point here, that cold reading is actually a very complex set of techniques. I estimate there are approximately 75 different techniques that go under the umbrella of cold reading. Uh, that said, most of what is being passed off as cold reading in the literature, both of magic and skepticism, is essentially one of those 75 techniques, specifically. Uh, <coughs> The, 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 uh, the four, the four uh, paragraphs, four reading, yeah. uh, which just keeps getting recycled as if that is cold reading. Be so that as for, it may, Max, for our audience, yeah. uh, just elaborate on the four. The four paragraph, paragraph is, is, is literally that. It's a paragraph of statements about you uh, that most people will read and say, yes, that's, that is me. That is a description of me. And if it's framed properly, and Randy has done this in performance, where he's given groups of college students or whatever, readings that are ostensibly generated by their birthdays or other information, and they're told these are specific readings about you. Please rate them. And then they read them and say, wow, this is very accurate. I would say this is 90% correct. And then it's revealed that everybody received exactly the same paragraph. Hmm. And that's a forward reading, but named after the fellow who's uh, uh, the psychologist who, who uh, developed these statements uh, the better part of half a century ago. But most of what's being passed off as cold reading under See, that yeah, title is actually this very limited <laughs> it's that one portion of cold reading. There are many, many other techniques involved, and it's become a catch-all among uh, those who haven't really studied it, which includes skeptics, but also includes most would-be mentalists, uh, to just sort of, in the same way that many non-magicians in watching Magic Trick will say, well, it's, it's all their sleeves, or it's all threads. Uh, or mirrors or whatever, cold reading is now the catch-all for, for any time someone apparently reads another person. Oh, it's just cold reading. And, and most psychic advisors, most people making a buck counseling people, spiritual advisors, maybe they're sometimes called, aren't uh, learning what they do from the magic community. Right. They're learning what they do maybe from their own communities. Uh, if it's well, from my culture. They're, they're, they're I, I think in fact like many of them are, are, are learning it yeah. in, 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 in within a belief system of their own. Right, right. They don't, yeah, they, exactly. They're not consciously using cold reading techniques. They're, they're, they're using reading techniques that turn out upon analysis to be cold reading techniques. That was my experience is that I found that a lot of psychics are not even aware that they're doing it. And uh, I think Maria Nurbank is somewhere in, in the audience. Uh, that was her experience. She uh, did some psychic things, and then she saw my Penn and Teller episode, and she realized, wow, I was just doing what he was doing. So uh, yeah, uh, it, it has to do with the culture. Some people are from a specific culture where their mother did it, their grandmother did it. It's just the job they do. So they don't, they don't look at it, number one, as a con, it's a way of life, and number two, it's part of their, part of their lifestyle. Uh, let me ch I'll give you Please. the psychological uh, background to this. In other words, there is good psychological evidence. Uh, there is a, um, during the heyday of Skinnerian psychology, um, students at Harvard got this idea because of his preaching and so on, that if you can use uh, positive reinforcement without people knowing it, you can control things. And so one of the lecturers, uh, for Bill Verplank, who was pushing this, uh, when he was lecturing, he was on a little platform, and the students, uh, among themselves, they decided every time he came, moved towards the left edge of the platform, they'd all pay, stand, sit up and pay attention. When he wandered from that, they would sit back. 
Very soon he got right to the end and he actually fell off. <laughs> well, this is what's going on, my, I'm pretty sure what's going on with the people who naively try to do readings and then get better and better at it. They're getting subtle feet. When you're doing a reading, you're getting a lot of feedback. And you know when you're getting positive feedback. For example, when I did palm readings all the, all the many years, I was, I finally figured it out consciously, but people, when I'm giving them a reading and telling them what they want to hear, they're pushing their hands very subtly towards me. Mm. When I'm telling them things they don't want to hear, they're pulling their hands away from me. And almost as if they are forming the reading with their hands, and you get good at picking up these uh, input, and that changes your behavior, you get better and better. So some of the readers giving psychic advice uh, are training themselves to be they're in self training readers right. without knowing it. That's they're, right. Yeah. So you learn, you learn what assumptions. works yeah, right. exactly. real fast. But it's automatic and, and it's uh, what we call uh, you know, uh, a reinforcement, right. basically. Banachek, the, uh, the sorts of techniques that magicians uh, are aware of, they're uh, uh, codified, there's a sort of scholarship uh, at least ideally, you know, people uh, uh, teach these methods and they're, they're criticized or in the magic journals they're published and magicians uh, get to use them among themselves. Uh, there's psychic entertainer associations where uh, this know-how is shared back and forth. Uh, but that's, uh, those are deceptive methods that uh, cold, uh, the sort of cold reading Ray Hyman just mentioned, uh, there's not that communication system for those secrets to be shared around necessarily. I, I think Max said it well. I mean, so many mental not health... A, not on microphone or on microphone? On microphone. Okay. I mean, he said it very well. You know, the majority of mentalists, the majority of magicians think they know cold reading, but they don't. They just know one small area, and they don't even know that very well. But because they're magicians, other people, lay people go, oh, they must be expert at that. Oh, because I can tell you your social security number, oh, you must be really good at cold reading. And, and it's accepted as a fact they're good at cold reading, but most of them really suck at cold reading. The best cold readers are the people that are out there doing it every day. I don't think that's the question. I think what the question is, is it ethical for those people to do that? And what I mean by that, and, I don't, I, and I'd be interested to find the answer from everybody else here, because you have a psychologist who, who goes to, well, he's not a psychologist yet, but he goes to college, he goes to school, he learns to be a psychologist or a therapist, all right? So he's learned these techniques. Um, and it's training. And it, it's, tra it's training. Yeah. And then you have somebody who's out there with the real public, not necessarily trying to deceive, as you said, you know, they learn as they go along, they think that they're absolutely genuine, and they get very, very good at it, and they get good at giving fairly good advice. Is that, is it ethical for them to do that? Well, that, that's the justification. Where's that I, line? You, you know, know, the, the psychic the says, I'm, you know, you go to a psychiatrist or a psychoanalyst, you go five times a week for 15 years, spend a fortune and nothing changes. You go to a, a Rogerian counselor or maybe just a well-meaning psychic who believes she's real, you get some unconditional positive regard, you get some fellow feeling, you get some pablum advice, maybe not good advice, but not bad advice either, and you walk away, at least the justification is, feeling better. Oh, well, someone I think heard that's the me question, made though. me feel good. Yeah. I think that's the question. Is it ethical for them to do that? As opposed to, um, I can't remember exactly what the question was in the beginning, but it's kind of like we're stepping around the actual question itself. So, um, By the, can I jump in with one little oh, thing? Please. That's yeah. fine. Uh, that's later. Uh, uh, Max, Maven, and I uh, were engaged, along with some people from the Psych Entertainment Association, by Gary Schwartz. Uh, Gary Schwartz is the guy who was bringing you, who, who tried to validate and did validate uh, John Edward and other psych uh, people talk to the dead. He's still doing those experiments. And uh, people were accusing him of, of his uh, psychics that he's justifying in his so called scientific articles as, uh, as it, it, his spiritual mediums like John Edward and so on are simply using cold reading techniques. So he wanted to eliminate that possibility, and the way he was going to eliminate it, he was going to get experts in cold reading, and he had Max, myself, and some people from the Psychic Entertainers Association. He gathered us, he paid our way to go to uh, meet in a hotel somewhere in Berkeley or Burbank. Burbank. And we spent the whole day, one whole day, watching uh, some uh, films that, that he had made of John Edwin, people doing stuff in his laboratory. And next day he met with us, and wanted to discuss the cold reading. His purpose was to show that his people aren't doing cold reading. Now, the danger here was he had a very limited notion of cold reading, 
And uh, so the very fact that people don't have a good, don't know all the techniques that Max was talking about, uh, has had some negative consequences. This guy thinks, even to this day, that he eliminated cold reading as a possibility when he didn't come anywhere near close to doing that. Right. So, Gary Schwartz, I must say, I came to visit me at the James Randi Educational Foundation in, in Fort Lauderdale. <coughs> Uh, he came there with uh, some lady friend of his who hated me. I could tell from the stares she was giving me. Um, <clears throat> the hair at the back of my head, there is some there. I actually rose when she stared at the back of my head. But uh, he promised, he listened carefully to what I had to say. I had written quite a presentation for him. For 45 minutes, I lectured him on the fact that he needed expert advice in evaluating these things. And he listened attentively, he made notes and such. At the end of that, he said, well, this has been quite a revelation to me. I had no idea these elements that are at work in this process. Mr. Randy, we're going to work together on this. Never heard from him again. Not a whisper, except to denunciate everything that I had ever said. But that kind of a promise, that kind of agreement and such, really buoyed me. I thought to myself, now I can be of they some direct use them. in a specific case, because he was hugely funded. He had all the money to work with that, that he could ever have wanted from the University of Arizona, I believe it was, or Arizona Arizona's University, yeah. whichever. No, no it, it's so, uh, just to be defend the University of Arizona, the funds he got was from private sources. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was. Oh, yeah. I, well, he got it. Yeah, and, 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 yeah. The, what they should be ashamed of is that they still keep him on the staff. Mm. Yeah, I, I agree. So, m distinguished panelists, uh, to finish up uh, the discussion of, uh, on this notion of magicians versus psychics, uh, Mark wrote a book as a longtime magician and a skeptic, and as I read the book, uh, a psychic or a former psychic. You, you talked about how you got involved in that and your motivations you mentioned now. Um, and Randy uh, wrote the forward or the introduction. I don't have the book in front of me. Um, and uh, you make claims in the book, or you could sort of share uh, anecdotes about uh, uh, your experiences as a psychic and what we can learn from it. And as I understand from Randy, we've had conversations. The reason he wrote that intro is because of what people can learn from that account. Still, as we've had this discussion, uh, it seems there's consensus, there's agreement that any time you're giving that sort of psychic advice or uh, dealing with these uh, central beliefs people have and uh, helping them with their problems, uh, that you need to tread lightly and dis use disclaimers and uh, not sort of be a uh, counselor. I speak for everyone except for Max as his bristling. Um, well, I'm just not sure where you got the word consensus out of. Uh, can, consensus minus one, uh, and and even and no, even. No, I don't. I, I don't think it's 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 that lopsided. And even yeah. even Max or uh, uh, Banachek, uh, uh, when we're talking about disclaimer, we understand as uh, Mark mentioned, or when we're talking about Dunninger opening with the linking rings, that's a way to frame things in ways uh, that may let folks know. I'm not real. No, no, it's no. also Remember a way I made the point no, I no. made. No, no. I, I, you're missing yeah. the point I made. Yeah, that, was, yeah. that was a way of digging it in, driving home that what they're doing is, is re the real thing. Yeah. Here is an example of something that's not real. This is a magic trick. Okay. Yeah. And so by inference, in, in everything small, else I'm doing yeah. is real. That was not a disclaimer. That yeah. was him building up what he's already doing is real. It's kind of like me doing a so, card trick. So this is fake, and what I'm about to show you is real. That's yeah. right. Exactly. But so, point. Let me make a very simple statement Please. here. Uh, the issue of disclaimers is one that has been discussed many times over the years, both within mm -hmm. magic and mentalism circles, but also in skeptical circles. So let me make the following simple statement of fact. Disclaimers don't do anything. Mm. That's true. Other than perhaps make certain skeptics feel better. But the, but the, proof, on that, the proof on that is a fellow named David Hoy. David Hoy, who began as a Baptist minister, and then became a mentalist, and later became a real psychic, whatever the hell that means. Uh, but during the middle phase, Dave was working Playboy clubs in the 1960s under the name Dr. Faust. And his opening line, he would come out on stage and he would say, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Dr. Faust and I am a fake. I don't know how much of a, a, a more clear disclaimer you, you could give. 
And after virtually every show, someone would come up to him and say, okay, I know you made the disclaimer for legal reasons, but when did you get these powers? <laughs> someone. Yeah, but yes. Max, Max I, I think on that, that that was just something he said at the very beginning, and then he goes out and blows them away, and they have no knowledge at that point. The majority of the audience f forgot. By the way, he, he uh, ran the Fundamental, Fundamental Universal Church of Knowledge. Take the acronym on that. So, yes. Um, Sister organization to the Consumer Union Network that was uh, <laughs> during the Satiristas. But, but, but I, I, I personally, when it comes to disclaimers, a lot of people argue with me. Um, I usually, in my regular show, have a disclaimer in the middle, you know, at the beginning and, and towards the end. Uh, not the show you just saw recently, but because that was a much shorter version of it from my show. But I feel a responsibility. You know, a lot of uh, magicians and mentalists will simply say, you know, if you were doing Macbeth, you would not stop in the middle of it and say, oh, I'm just an actor. Well, of course not, because that's context. I, I believe when people go see a play, they know the context. But when I get up on stage as a mentalist, and I'm doing these unusual things that they have no explanation for whatsoever. I become the authority figure on that. What I say goes at that moment. It's no different than having a neurosurgeon stand on a stage in a theater, and he starts talking about the human mind, the brain, and people will sit there and go, wow, this guy really knows what he's, he really is a neurosurgeon. So I can become a psychic if that's what I want to do on that stage. Um, so I know that there's gonna be a large amount of people who are gonna come to my show. They're gonna believe no matter what I say, they're gonna believe. There's gonna be an amount of people that are not gonna believe no matter what I say. But there's a large amount of people in the center somewhere who come to the show and they have absolutely no clue. And they see what I do and they want an answer for what it is. And I feel a responsibility to give them, give them the answer and remind them, this is just entertainment, I'm not a psychic. Now, I know some of those people are still gonna think I probably am, I get that. But there's quite a lot of people that will come up to me after the show and they will say to me, but you really, just like you said with, with, with David, who probably claimed he was a psychic and said, hey, later. I'll give you some readers. Later. You not know? during the not during the Dr. Fosper. Okay, but later he went off that deep end and yep. he did, if, you know, what we call a deep end here. But um, so so when they come to me and they say, hey, um, you know, you have powers that has to be real. I say no. It's one of those things I told you about. It's either you know it's magic, psychology, verbal, nonverbal communication, all mixed together. You know, primarily magic. I'm not a psychic. There are people who will get on this stage, they will do what I do, they will try to convince you they're real. No, so you, they're you, lying to you, or you have, lying you to themselves. You have over the years made, among other things, made very good use of that wonderful Ned Rutledge song, uh, line. I absolutely do, yes. Yeah, I take my five minute senses to create the illusion of a sick. Mm. Which I think is a wonderful description. All I'm saying here, I'm not saying, I, I think that the issue of disclaimers, the issue of audience perception, uh, is, is not an insignificant issue. And I think it's an issue that involves responsible decisions being made sure. by the performer. I, mean, I don't know I what don't the answers think that are everyone for each individual. I can't tell you what your should be. Same is. Oh, my conclusions. Be. All I'm saying is there, there, there is this almost magical belief that the existence of a disclaimer solves the problem. It doesn't. And it doesn't. And uh, most, disclaimer yes. is to the issue of, of belief systems like a band-aid to cancer. Yeah. 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 So, Randy, you wrote the introduction to a book of, a, uh, uh, of Marx where he talked about being a psychic and uh, explored some of these issues. Um, in closing, let's get comments from the panelists on, uh, uh, you know, really where this line is. All of you are magicians. Uh, one of you, and I think uh, actually Ray also, and Randy early in his career, <laughs> Uh, and uh, uh, w would make stronger claims, even though Ray, earlier in his career, uh, when you were doing palmistry, at first you were sort of persuaded that, wow, this is so effective, maybe I do have an ability. Um, none of you now are giving psychic advice, to my knowledge, you're not giving psychic <coughs> advice, trying to help people with their belief in the paranormal. Um, if if there is a line and it's not disclaimers, last question, uh, illicit discussion, um, where is the line? Okay, um, well let me, let me, yeah. let me, it's so black and white, it really is like, for example, if an agent hires me to do a children, not a children's party, an adult party and they want to see handwriting analysis, mm -hmm. and they don't want psychics and they don't want tarot cards because Handwriting analysis is more scientific. Mm -hmm. It's a system. 
Once you learn a system and you know how to get on your feet and run with it, it's no different than palm reading or anything else, okay? So, but if an agent hires me to be a, 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 a handwriting analysis, I wear a suit and tie and I go in and I'm a handwriting analysis. And Dude. I try to inject, let me finish, yeah. I try to inject, no matter what situation it is, skepticism into what I'm doing. But do you think people leave your handwriting analysis demonstrations thinking that you're learning about their personality from No, they leave analysis? my handwriting demonstrations entertained, which and is what they And if you're hired as a psychic before. reader, Mark? Pardon me? And if you're hired as a psychic reader? What? I don't understand so what, what the question is. What do you do if you're hired as a psychic reader? So, uh, are you, so you go as a psychic reader? I guess that's what he's asking. Are you hired as a psychic reader and do you do other things like I, Like I just said, I inject, I make sure that when I am giving a reading, and this is why I think I have been successful, if whatever that means, I, while I'm giving them the reading, I tell them things like, yes, if I'm looking at the lines in your hand, by the way, there is some science here. Did you know that this about your fingers and this about your hands? So if you're hired as a psychic reader and you give a psychic reading, does the subject of your psychic reading come away believing you might possibly be psychic or disbelieving it? Or what information do you, do you uh, provide, if any, to that? Just like I, I let them decide for themselves. You let them decide themselves. That's correct. Can I say one thing on that? I, real quick? Can, yeah, I, yeah, can I say one thing on that? Yeah. I, I would have an issue with that. Um, of course. And I tell you, no, well, no, I tell you why I have an issue with that. And yeah, we had to get to this point no, no, eventually, no, right? No, no, let me explain I why. I tried three or four times and it didn't work. Let me work. explain yeah. why we, I have an issue with that because you're reading the poem, you're saying this line means that, that line means that, and right. then you give them a real fact about something about their hand, and all that does is bolster up that, hey, those lines must also mean something as well. Because no. you don't say straight out, which total BS that that line means that, you know, it's a, if you were doing palm reading, you know, that line would mean that, light line mean that, but you know what? It's not real. You Have don't you ever had that. a reading by me? I, I'm, I'm asking you, you because my book? what you just said a minute ago was that I give a reading on the palm, and then I give them some actual facts that are true. This is, this so is true. What and what I also say is I say to them something like, you know, it doesn't matter whether I use your palm or uh, goat entrails or cat turds, whatever it is, all I'm doing is telling you, answering questions that you're asking me in the most honest way I can. So unless you've had a reading by me, you're putting me, you're lumping me in with the gypsy carnival, and, and that I object to. And if you read my book, you'll see clearly now, it goes I read back, the book, Mark, the same, and I couldn't figure out what side you were on. Uh, and it took me quite a while, yeah. because you were on more sides than I could count, but then suddenly the answer became clear to me. You're on one very clear side, your side. Yeah. And that's so, the only side you're on. So, and you um, have contempt for your subjects, that you read them if they're oh, not wise right. enough to take your advice or appreciate your wondrousness and the gift of their lives. Other than that, you have nothing but contempt for them. And it's clear that you are a lowercase skeptic in that you don't believe any of the bullshit you're selling. Oh, I see. But to be an uppercase skeptic, uppercase skeptics are not the people in this room and the other people on this, some of the other people on this panel are, are not just concerned with what you, what you as an individual think or see about the world. We're concerned with educating others That's what and the book improving is others' lot in the world. Well, first of all, okay? my character And as such, world. it is impossible for me to see you okay. as an ally in this movement. You were not an investigator when you were working for 900 lines. You were paying the rent as a phony psychic. Okay, can so I respond to that? Please, Mark. Yeah. And okay, well, uh, I, I totally anticipated this attack. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, but not because you're psychic. <laughs> well, touche. Yeah, please. Well, I, you know, we don't have enough time. That we're going to run out of time, so I don't Try. Know, I really want to defend what I did either. You know, I did not write this book. I didn't want the character to be admirable. I wasn't writing a debunking book. You succeeded book. at that. Good. Then you got it. So the point was, these are despicable human beings. And I wanted to show a anti-hero, maybe. I don't know. The point was, my publisher didn't want another debunking book. He wanted a book like Nightmare Alley. 
You wanted a book about what it's really like, what the business is like, what are these, how low can you go when you're laughing at somebody who's just lost their pet cat and you're doing a reading telling them or where their dead pet child. cat is. And there was never a dead child. Well, how in low my can book. you go? You're in the same company. No, I'm and sorry, that's not true. There were, I never pretended to talk to dead I'll people. I'll just leave this. Some years ago, uh, and I I, DJ, you, 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 I, you mentioned this. I, I won't do the, tell the whole story right now. We haven't got time. Maybe someday. But um, Psychop embraced Greskin and brought him to a national mm -hmm. conference. This led to a, to a very strong and really permanent, more or less, disagreement between Paul Kurtz and myself. Randy could uh, tell you about that too. I remember and, uh, uh, and basically what I said to Kurtz, and I'll repeat it here for the record, which is, if you're gonna call yourself a skeptic, if you're in the magic, if you're in magic or, or mentalism or any, any of these mystery arts, let's call it, pretentiously, he said, um, <clears throat> and you're gonna claim that you're a skeptic activist and you're trying to make the world a better place with your specialized knowledge, the one requirement, the litmus test, entry to the club, claim for that good, being part of that good cause, is you need to be willing to be explicit about what you do. You need to be willing to say that you, whether it's trickery, magic, deception, whatever specific words you want to use, but you need to label the product, okay? And Mark, your website to this day says, that you neither declare yourself as a genuine psychic nor give any disclaimers, preferring to let his work stand on its own merits, such as it is, and allow each individual to arrive at their own personal conclusions. You may be many things, Mark, but you're not a capitalist skeptic and you're not part of my movement. Well, so, so uh, with that bolstering guess, sense of fellow feeling, he told two, you, so. uh, two things, Mark, please, a rejoinder, and we'll end with Randy's uh, thoughts uh, any, uh, anybody, on the discussion. Anybody who knows what I do for the IIG and what I've done for the last several years on the Jeff Probe show and on uh, Inside Edition with Teresa Caputo, uh, you go to my website and in 10 seconds, I mean, yeah, that's, that's on my website because I do want people to feel like it's okay for you to make up your own mind. But if you look at the balance of the rest of the re website, you're going to see skeptical all written all over it. The first 10 seconds you go to my website. So he can think whatever he wants, you know, that's fine. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. But uh, I have information to give this movement and I feel like I have information that's valuable. If you don't want it, Fine, that's what he's saying. You don't want to know how some of these things, he's a magician, a mentalist. He doesn't, he did not go into this movement as a psychic, who would, okay? So again, I'm not gonna defend myself, you either like the book or you don't. Check out my IIG creds, check out all the testing I've been involved with. We do tests all the time, a couple times a year. Okay, and I'm the one who is there working for this movement. So I don't, I'm not worried about being a capital top drawer skeptic if this is the kind of reception I'm going to get because I'm used to it. I'm used to being on this burner. So I leave it up to you. You get to decide. There's no absolutes. Okay, sorry, and, that's all I have to say. And before we finish, Randy up, wouldn't write the introduction if he thought I wasn't part of the movement. Okay. And before we finish up with Randy, and before we finish up with Randy, Mark, uh, while I objected to some things in your book personally, I will commend the book on the grounds you just mentioned. There's a lot to learn from it. We're not talking ethics there when we're reading it. We're talking about learning uh, that it's inside It's not school. for skeptics. It's yeah. for the general, the person who's at the airport who says, oh, I'd like to read something interesting on the flight home. Oh, I think it's great so, for skeptics. So, I recommend uh, it. Randy, do you have some closing yeah. thoughts on this? It, it should be said, skeptics like a lot of heat, but we also want to elicit light with our conversations as well. <laughs> well, I, uh, good luck on that. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for giving me the privilege of closing this discussion. I would like to do it on somewhat a lighter note, if I may. A story about a gentleman whose name I'm passing down the table to be recognized here, but we won't use the name. This was a very prominent mentalist when I was a kid. I was a, a young teenager, and uh, I had the freedom to wander about for various reasons and see shows that I wanted uh, to observe. And I saw this gentleman, 
uh, advertised, and I knew that he was a well-known mentalist, and his name is still famous in the field, and I went in to see his performance. It was at some ladies' club or other, and I sat in the back and I watched, and I, I understood most of what he was doing, uh, but one trick that he did with a book really floored me, and I thought, wow, I've got to come back tomorrow and see this again. I came back the next day, paid my admission again, and sat in the same seat at the back of the room, and I saw it the second time, and suddenly, oh, of course, it dawned on me what he was doing. So I, I had the opportunity to visit him backstage. I went around, I called, and I said, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a student magician, I'm just getting started in the field, and he was rather looking down his nose at me, and uh, I said, did, just tell me one thing, if you would be so kind. I did somebody uh, in Poland, he came from Poland, uh, someone in Poland uh, teach you this routine as a, as a youth, perhaps, or is this something that you originated entirely yourself? And he said, I don't understand what you mean. I said, the, the routines that you're doing, the, the tricks. And he looked at me and said, tricks? I said, yes, tricks. And he said, you don't understand, young man. That's all done up here. And I just turned on my heel and left and thought, I'm not gonna have much of a conversation with this man. Well, a few weeks later, I was doing an escape act. And I, I had a date where I found out that I was be, being worked on the same program as this particular gentleman. And I thought, oh, hey, I want to run into him. I went out on stage and I did my straitjacket escape and perhaps a couple of rope ties, I don't remember. I got a very, very good reaction. It's the usual reaction. And, <laughs> and uh, I walked back and <laughs> to the dressing room, and he came out of his little dressing room at one side there, he came over and he shook my hand, he said, that was quite remarkable. Uh, where did you learn that? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. And I just looked yeah. at him and I said, and walked away, never spoke to this gentleman again. Join me in thanking our